Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of the Articulate Fly, and we're back with another Matt the Hatch with Matt Green. How you doing, Matt? How's it going, Marvin? You doing okay? Just trying to stay out of trouble. I appreciate you uh, taking a little bit of time away from your samples in the lab to talk sulfurs with us today. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about sulfur mayflies. These are mayflies in the family of Simrilidae. They have a couple of cousins in the east. Uh, Eastern North America, the, the Hendrickson mayfly, Ephemerella subvaria, and then the, the little sulfur, which is Ephemerella dorothea, and that's a little bit smaller than Ephemerella invaria, the true sulfur. Uh, the, the one you see most people write about in fish, sometimes the little dorothea sulfurs get looked over. And, and actually, for the longest time, I swore to many people there were, there were none over on South Alston, over in Tennessee. But it turns out there's a, there's a small population over there from about the, the Weaver Pike Bridge downstream to where the lake used to be. Everything has changed so much over the last five, six, seven years over there with them working on TVA, working on the dam and bringing the lake down a lot. But you do see some of those Dorothea sulfurs over on the Watauga, the Sister Tell Water. And, and these insects are found all over the east coast from florida all the way to maine and, and they can be part of your fishing in any any point or along those uh, along that uh, latitudinal gradient some of the other relatives of the sulfurs that we really won't get into today but we might talk about later are called the saratella mayflies these are the pink ladies they actually have like a pinkish, orangish abdomen with dun wings, and they'll actually emerge sometime around August or September and create some really, really good fly fishing opportunities for uh, folks along the east coast, especially in the southeast. Uh, another relative you might see people talk about or see on the water are the Darth Vader mayflies, Marvin, believe it or not. These are Telegonopsis deficients. They're actually mayflies that are almost jet black to blue, purple in coloration. They're really cool looking. And in fact, they'll come out right about now, uh, here in the next uh, month or so. Uh, I remember in Pennsylvania, I used to fish the Telegonopsis deficients right after the green drakes uh, were finished. And so after the drakes would finish, you would fish what are called granella mayflies. Another ephemeralid mayfly in the in the West. These are called the the, uh, the, the green drakes. <laughs> uh, but here out in the in the East, uh, the Drenella cornuta mayfly specifically, or these uh, mid morning to late morning duns, green in coloration with dun wings, coming out on cloudy days between eleven to one p.m. Um, in the afternoon, directly following them, you'd see the Darth Vader mayflies, these little size 22s and 20 duns that would come off and uh, come off in droves to very fishable and very fun. Got it. And, you know, in terms of, you know, I know, for example, the South Holston has one of the longest sulfur hatches uh, in the country. But, you know, in terms of tailwaters versus freestones, what should folks expect to see from a hatch perspective? Uh, in the southeast for freestone sulfurs, that's going to be some here best dry fly fishing. I've been on little little trickles fishing sulfurs to brook trout and even rainbow trout in some sections. I mean, you're, you're going to have fishable hatches. They're going to be your best of the year. Um, in the mid-Atlantic, from Virginia up to through Pennsylvania, this is going to be some of your best fishing as well, and it's coinciding with some of those larger bugs that occur in, later in May, the green drakes, which are probably only um, a week or two at most uh, away. I know it's going to warm up real quick here towards the end of the week and the next week, and um, I think the green drakes are probably going to be on time in many mid-Atlantic places like Penns, Fishing Creek, um, some of the other uh, big name locations on the West Branch of the Delaware along the New York Pennsylvania border, they should be on time. Um, and if they're not, they're only just a couple of days off. 
Uh, sulfurs on the tailwaters can be very prolific, P- provide blanket uh, emergences or hatches that at times can be almost unfishable. I know the last couple of weeks I was up on the Watauga for the early sulfur uh, blanket emergences that occur over there. And there are so many bugs on the water. It, sometimes you, you just couldn't full fish. You had to really wait until and you know, the, the bugs were a little bit less prolific. And then the fish would actually cue in on the, the imitations, the flies. You wouldn't be able to get them otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, I got it. So, but how long, for example, on the free stones will the hatches last? Because I know that. Oh, 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 you're talking duration. Yep. So, uh, typically in the Southeast, starting anywhere between mid April, lasting until maybe the first or second week of May for the free stones on the Watauga tailwater, uh, beginning after the end of the granums or mixing in with the granums at least down low, ending sometime uh, the first or second week of May, and then up closer to town in Elizabethan, lasting anywhere into early to mid-June, and starting about the same time as in the lower section. On South Holston, any time between uh, late April and November or early December, sometimes a spotty emergence up top closer to the dam in January. And lower down, you're going to see them beginning um, kind of so late April, mid-April, lasting sometimes until the end of May. Uh, Middle River, you're going to start to see them early to mid-May, lasting and throughout the month sometimes to the first or second week of June. And then further up top, looking for them either early to mid-June, sometimes the end of May, but that's kind of a rarity, lasting all the way until November. And so up top on South Holston is going to be your best chance to really get them almost all year round. Uh, In the Mid-Atlantic, in Virginia, and in the Pennsylvania, you're going to see sulfurs in the freestone streams beginning early to mid-May, lasting for a couple of weeks. In the the spring creeks, normally mid to late May, lasting for a couple of weeks. And and you do have your odd rarity situations where you have water temperatures that don't really exceed 50 or 55 Fahrenheit and don't really go below 40 or 45 degrees Fahrenheit. In those spring creeks, you might see sulfurs all year round. But the bulk of that emergence is going to be, uh, you know, May, early June. I've been on the Tort Spring Run and fished sulfurs October, November, December, January, February. I mean, it happens during the winter uh, on warm days, but th- those are really odd occurrences. Got it. And so how do you like to fish the hatch? Oh, very methodical, Morgan. Normally, I use my CDC flies, as we've talked about on your program before, uh, size 14, 16, or 18, really depending on what bugs are coming off. True sulfurs, early on, sometimes they're a bigger bug. You need a 14, but some sometimes the fish are picky and require the 16. Normally, a yellow abdomen with done wings sometimes tan wings. Really, sometimes you have to experiment on what the fish are are taking. If you've got lower light conditions, you can probably go with a little bit darker wing. If you've got bright light, you can probably go with a lighter wing. Uh, That's a little trick I've learned. Uh, If you've got the little sulfurs coming off, these are going to be a size 20 or 18. Um, Yellow bodies with a kind of a light cream-colored wing almost clear uh, it's not a done wing it's, it's more of a like a light cream you need to match your cdc for that especially on tailwater rivers fish are going to get very very picky uh, normally fishing 6x liters marvin sometimes you can get away with 15 uh, especially on a place like south holston once the hatch really really gets going you can go to a 15 but early on they get picky you want a 16 uh 
X, or excuse me, a six X leader to that. Um, 5X leaders uh, a little bit further on. And as, as the hatch really gets going over on South Holston, I moved to an, kind of a, an orange by it, colored body with a uh, kind of a ginger to tan wing on top. Got it. And do you have a nymph pattern you like kind of before the hatch? Yeah, I, I do. I do. I'd rather not put that on on the podcast. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll be I'll be honest. You know, that's kind of a creation of a friend of mine, Mr. Pat Stone, and we've kind of keep that in secret. All I will say is that there's some CDC involved to keep the fly floating higher in the water column. What you may notice especially once the sulfurs really get going on a good day and you're uh, trying to work a blanket emergence, what you will find is that larger fish that have been around a block a time or two, uh, they'll hang out just under the surface and sit on the nymphs that are emerging, drifting down, rising to the water surface to emerge. And the trick really is to find a fly a nymph in this case, not an emerger, not something with a bunch of CDC that creates unnecessary bolts. These fish are looking for insects and imitations that look just like nymphs. They're not looking for uh, soft tackles. They're not looking for any of this uh, Sylvester nymphs, spider flies, none of, the, none of that. They're looking for nymph-like imitations. So the trick is to design the fly so that it also floats. So we incorporated just a little bit of CDC into the thorax and, and that gives it, that gives it, you know, enough floating um, capacity, you know, with, with the help of some frog stain or some additional uh, hydrophobic reagents and additions that put that fly in the, you know, right where it needs to be in the water columns to that fish thinks it's real. Yeah, there you go. And uh, how about the spinner fall? Oh, you want to talk about spinners, Marvin? I see you really digging into me here, Marvin. Get your talons in, Marvin. <laughs> Just trying to get all the info for the folks. Oh, I know. I know. You're trying to get that info. I got you. No, I'm, I'm just messing with you, man. Um, so I've designed a, a spinner pattern that I, I actually think works really, really well. It, it doubles too as a done because during the spinner fall, there can sometimes not be a clear distinction between emergence and egg laying. You will have dons emerging as you have spinners laying eggs, uh, the, the females, which are actually going to be uh, more of an orange color than the rusty uh, orange of, of the male. Uh, just kind of a quick aside. Uh, but I've designed a pattern that kind of imitates both done and spinner so you fish it at the same time. It's just a, an, uh, kind of an orange to a darker orange body to imitate the female with done hackle that oversized the hook size. So this is a size 16 hook with gauge 12 hackle in done. It's palmered around the hook on a diagonal, on a slant. The slant allows the fibers to be uh, pulled back at a 60 degree angle with the hook shape so that they look like wings that are laid down on the water surface. Um, and I, I, I mentioned that 60 degree angle, but that's important because when you look at the wings laying flat on the water surface, those wings on the, the distal margin have a, have a slant to them as they go into the thorax. And so that's important. After you're done palmering the fly, apply some, some head cement or something like that, then take out a pair of nice scissors sharp scissors and cut off 
the top and the bottom of the hackle. And by doing that, you can you can get a nice wing profile and hackle. Uh, sometimes I'll put like a like a little CDC parachute on it too to help with visibility. But I honestly think sometimes that detracts from the fish wanting it because fish, when they're eating spinners, they're either doing one of two things. They're eating sunken spinners where they're eating spinners right in the surface film. And any kind of bulk added to the fly that doesn't look natural for a picky fish, tailwater fish, selected trout, they're going to see this. They're going to deny it. And so sometimes if I see the fish are being really picky, I won't, I won't use those uh, CDC parachute flies that I have in my box. I'll only use the flies that I have tied up that just have hackle on them. Got it. Well, I think we've uh, we've pretty well covered the sulfur thing. Don't you think so, Matt? Yeah. I mean, there's one other fly that I use uh, that has caught fish and has not caught fish. It was in Fly Fisherman magazine. It's a, it's a tied on a J hook with these JSON wings that you that you make with wing burners and a a hackle collar near the head and it works out. It works pretty well for real picky fish, but keep in mind you fish that fly sunken. That's a sunken spinner. It's made to be something that you fish wet with a a lizard ring lift technique such that you really are fishing two fish that are below the fill, not fish that are taking egg laying females right on the surface. And, and that's an important designation because really when you're fishing a spinnerfall, you're fishing the egg laying females. The males really aren't making it to the surface. These rusty brown to rusty red or rusty orange colored insects. Uh, they're most of them are flying to live another day. Uh, once they're done mating with the females and then the, ma- the females begin laying eggs, dipping eggs onto the water surface, most of the male sulfurs are going back up in a tree or nearby vegetation and they live on another day or two to continue to mate with females that become available. And, and so you're really fishing females when you fish spinners. And, and some folks really don't ever consider that. And they forget about that or they might not. Uh, know the biology of the insects well enough to to know to do that but you're fishing females got it and you know folks we love questions at the articulate fly you can email them to us or send them to us on our facebook or instagram page and you know we love answering them so if you shoot us a question you know matt and i will knock it out on one of these uh upcoming matt the hatches well matt i will uh let you get back to your dna sequencing and um i appreciate you taking some time Folks, get out there and catch a few. Tight lines, everybody. Tight lines, Matt. Thanks, Marvin. Tight lines.